it got to the point where our friendship is kind of like breathing. I mean, I can't imagine me without them, and they, I don't think, can imagine them without me anymore. So it's kind of like it's an automatic thing that this is happening, so we talk. Except it's not quite automatic either. But it's somewhere in between there. Between it's like breathing, but we're also conscious. The philosopher Aristotle once said, without friends, no one would choose to live, though he had all other goods. What role do friendships play in our lives? How do they help heal our bodies and minds? And how do we keep friendships alive? These are the questions we've been trying to answer on our two-part series on friendship. This is the second program in the series. I'm Rita Deverell, and this week journalist Sadi Azaman learns about the care and feeding of a strong friendship. It was in university my friendships with both women and men intensified. It was a time of change, of confusion. So we coped by turning to each other for advice, for comfort, for pizza and hot fudge sundaes. As our experiences and perceptions of the world began to broaden and then change, we disagreed. So we agreed to disagree. Now work, relationships, and other commitments have taken us to different parts of the country and on different paths. So as friends, we try to hold on to those things that brought us together. And while we're nurturing old friendships, new people touch our lives and leave deep impressions. The three people you'll meet today will also leave a lasting impression. Judith, Marsha, and Jack have been friends for 16 years. After the commercial, they'll tell you about the heartbreaks and joys of their friendship. citizen, uh, likely at this point in my head a citizen of the world, uh, who has a commitment to working with other people, particularly those on the margins, uh, because I think the leadership for the next future, leadership for the future will come from the margins. And so I'm an advocate for building those kinds of relationships. I'm a divorced woman, I'm a citizen of Canada, I'm an educator, I'm an advocate for rights, uh, people's rights, but especially people who've been labeled in some marginalizing kind of way. Um, I'd say I use a wheelchair. I'm a person who's trying to create a world where nobody's starving and nobody gets blown up because of the color of their skin and people get their needs met. And, and I get my needs met. And we, we all try to build a world where the rainforests aren't being cut down and where Judas Snow doesn't end up ever in an institution, ever, and neither do I. The circle started to form 16 years ago at York University in Ontario. It began when a student living with muscular atrophy helped a professor teach an education class. Later, Marsha's husband joined the circle. It was a dynamic, yet cautious, beginning. I remember that she was a name, until one day she came bouncing into my office with her dog and her bouncy hair and started to eat my lunch and her dog started to eat me. And, <laughs> <laughs> and there's this incredible woman who kind of like invaded all the normal situations that I was used to, right? Just coming right into my life loud and noisy and full of great ideas and wanting to do everything and wanting to get me involved in everything. And my first reaction was to be really afraid of her. I've never seen the disability. I, I've just never, I've always seen the woman. And I've, I saw a woman that was struggling with the same things that I was struggling with 
you know, as a woman struggling with the university, struggling with, you know, being a woman, you know, in a university setting, struggling with our mothers, you know, struggling with men, struggling with ourselves. That's what really got me and Judith interested in being friends. I don't know where miracles come in exactly, but see, I, I consider it a miracle for me to be able to overcome, first of all, for me to be able to overcome my fear of Marcia. Secondly, for her to have shown up in my life at all. See, the really remarkable thing about it from, well, the two sides, one is I said yes, but the other side is that she asked, right? I mean, I don't know where Marcia gets the chutzpah. It's an incredible streak that she has. But she never has seen me as somebody that needs to be taken care of. I don't think I saw Judith as a charity case. I think I have argued with Judith, and we have used all the charity arguments as survival strategies. And I think I've resented having to use them every inch of the way. I think I didn't understand um, all the time how deep the charity ethic is in our culture. So maybe, yeah, there's likely a level at which, sure, uh, Judith was another charity case. I think his initial relationship with me was shaped to a fairly large degree by a sense of charity and by a sense of protecting me much more so than Marsha's was. And even as he got to know me better and, and as we began, began to work more together, particularly before this year that he went away, there was always the sense that he was trying to do it for me. And um, not that he didn't like me, but there was no real, real sense that we were bound to each other. And I would often say, you know, I'm friends with Marsha, and leave Jack right out of the picture. Judith had learned early that charity can be dangerous, that good intentions hurt, that being someone's project means abandonment when the next project comes along. So as a child, she played alone, protected by the armor of her wheelchair. She had virtually no friends. Friends broke hearts and committed casual betrayals. One of the reasons I sang in the choir was because I really, really loved the choir master, whose name was Alan Clark, and he was blonde and wonderful and, and very, very friendly with me. Like, I used to sit in the hallway separate from all the other students. Like, I really did keep myself separate. And he would come and talk to me, so he was going out of his way to befriend me, right? And we got to grade 13, and um, we were practicing for one of the final concerts, I think just before Christmas. And Mr. Clark lined us all up and he put me behind the piano where no one could see me. And I was just devastated because I couldn't figure out why my friend would hide me. And when I asked, I think I asked him why he put me there and he gave me some kind of non-committal answer. And then I just couldn't express how deeply depressed and, and, and angry I felt about. So I just left the choir. I just went away, went back to class. And then I went home when I was quite, I ran a temperature for a while or something. And then I decided to go back and sit behind the piano. What did that mean when, when you decided to sit behind the piano? At the time, what it meant to me was that, that he had been my friend and I was going back for him, no matter what, because he was my friend, right? And I loved him. But later on, I began to realize that it was also a time in my life when I accepted other people's definition of myself as being someone who shouldn't be seen. As I grew up, I lived a life like a puppet. There was no Judith, really. I was what I was supposed to be, and simultaneously fighting what I was supposed to be. I wear the Thunderbird because it represents the essence of who I am, a spiritual warrior. I never knew that I could be that. I never even imagined before I met Marcia. 
You see me as if I am changing from a wounded to an unwounded person. For me, it is like I am becoming a person instead of being nothing. Some people don't trust other people are going to really like them. And especially in Judith's case, that was compounded by living in an institution at the time that, that we met. So the question must have been, well, what, what's this person? What, what's she, what, who is this person? My point of view, I think, is always, always colored by the fact that eventually they would abandon me. It took me many years to, to understand that I was even thinking that, right? So I'm sure I was always, oh, well, I know, for example, that I was always, always asking Marcia if she really meant what she said in one way or another. Not so much Jack, but certainly Marcia. I would always be questioning that up until about a year ago. But, you know, in some ways, I think they tested it as well. <laughs> I would say Marcia feels as insecure or felt as insecure in our relationship as I did. This is a surprise uh, birthday party. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. you. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday to you. Another year, Happy another birthday, victory. Dear, Doctors dear. told Judith she would only live until she was 30. Today, she's 43. And she has struggled to make it. When she met Jack and Marcia, she didn't tell them she went home to a chronic care institution every night, an institution that nearly killed her soul and malnourished her fragile body. So five months after her 30th birthday, Judith Snow collapsed physically and emotionally. The place I was, I was living in somebody's hallway, I ran out of money. I ran out of volunteers to do my intensive care and all sort of ran out at the same time. But in the meantime, I had met someone through Marsha who was experienced in building support circles around people who are in crisis. So I went to his office, and I stopped talking in his office. And he brought, he phoned Marsha and brought me to Marsha's house. And Marsha and Jack called together 14 people who knew me and knew them and said, what are we going to do so that Judith will start talking again? And so she came here and healed. And it, it was, I mean, it changed our lives, all of us, in the sense that it really taught us that if you ask people for help, they're all over the place. Uh, that's been the driving force in what we do, that really people are quite wonderful out there, but nobody asks anybody to help them. And so Judith asked for help, sort of screamed silently for help, and got it. And it was pretty fast that, that the circle formed and people came together and people wanted to come together and people want to come together to help me or to help Jack or to help you. But Judith was the gift that showed that. Now you're one of the few men who has helped Judith dress herself and look yeah. after some of the physical needs that she has to look after. Where, where do you draw the line between being a friend and being an attendant? I think early on, uh, I think I likely did more attendant care. Uh, it never occurred to me it had anything to do with friendship. It was something that needed doing, and I didn't mind doing it. It was no big deal. Um, it's pretty intimate. I mean, you, at, at one level, and, uh, but as we did more and more things together, I think one of the things that Judith asked was that we begin to separate the two, and I don't think I appreciated n with clarity the difference for quite a while. Uh, but now we're, I think, much more clear. And it's okay for me to do attendant care. I don't mind, and I don't think Judith minds most of the time. But... What's the um, difference? Uh, attendant care is listening. Attendant care is you are Judith's hands and feet. Friendship is something quite different because that's an interaction between two people. Uh, that's both of us being very present, or whoever's there. And that can involve you being hands and feet, but the primary issue is, is between two people, two personalities. Well, I would sort of mosey on down here, and Jack would be doing attendant care, 
And of course, Judith never wanted me to do attendant care because I was called the attendant from hell. Now I've improved over 16 years, <laughs> right? But Jack was really a good attendant because he listened better or whatever he did. And I thought, I really love this. I, I love their relationship. I love that this man that I married is a kind of a man that likes doing this with Judith. So I, I saw a whole side of Jack that I had never seen. I've seen other people, though, in, in the past feeling Judith has intruded because she develops like an intimacy with people that then threatens somebody in a relationship. But you know what? They must have a fairly insecure relationship, is my opinion. <laughs> because another person, in this case, enriched our relationship didn't take anything away. There were many other crises. At one time, Marcia was in the hospital for breast cancer, while Judith was in another hospital across the street for surgery. Jack kept them both sane. And then later, he nearly broke down because of job-related stress. Judith helped him regain his balance at a crucial point in his career. These friends support each other passionately, but they also fight with that same intensity. Marcia and Jack had told me that they would go to a certain event with me, and then they got a plan to do something else completely with somebody else. I was very, very jealous of Marcia's time in those days. Uh, so it was partly a combination of my jealousy that their time with Neil was more important than their time with me, I thought, right? But the other side of it was that they simply hadn't remembered or hadn't told me that they changed their plans, right? She got really upset and then we got really upset because like, no, we're taking this trip and, and, and uh, I guess one of the things that I had to learn was in those kinds of struggles, you can, you really do end up squaring off sometimes and because Judith did something that she was brilliant at and it was a survival strategy but my assessment she used it in other contexts she tried to guilt us into staying and and you know we played out all the silly little games that people play and and basically I in a fit of fury because Marcia was shredded and upstairs and so Christmas morning I said look if you can't straighten up and figure this out get out and I rolled her out. We dropped her off at her parents' home on Christmas morning, and nobody was speaking. And we didn't speak for, I don't know, a couple of months after that. We've all had fights with friends. And I've learned this over the last couple of years. It's not the fight that matters. It's whether people are willing to make up. There's nothing so big that we can fight about that we couldn't make up about. Now, she was, Judith was mad at that point because Jack and I were leaving. And she wanted us to attend something that, that she thought was very important. And I can understand in retrospect that that was the seed of a good fight, all right? But it, it's also been the seed of we all live our own lives and that the friendship has grown on allowing each other to live our own lives and make our own mistakes, you know? And, and that's how you grow. That was a biggie because that could have broken the relationship. But I think all of us decided that we liked each other enough that after a period of cooling off, you know, let's get together again and try this out. We weren't sort of a menage a trois. There were Marsh and I are husband and wife, and then Judith was a really good friend. So we had to figure out new boundaries. And as we grew closer, uh, that was exciting and pretty tense from time to time. Um, because as you do things more and more together, then what are the new boundaries? Like, how much is enough? It was a struggle to figure out how much independence, how much interdependence, and how much dependence you can tolerate in a relationship. I think the problem with people often who have been labeled disabled is people are so dishonest with them in the sense that they just, that somebody does something that pisses them off, okay? And they don't tell them the truth. And then it gets worse and worse and worse, and you grow further and further and further apart. And then you never, you, never, you never care enough to blow up. 
we can handle some of the ups and downs a bit more now. It's not quite the roller coaster it is at the beginning, but that's true, again, of, of any organization or friendship as it matures. We're like good wine right now. We're a little more mature, but we're, we're still bubbling. <laughs> Maybe we're champagne. Like most true friendships, this one has gone through the struggles, the tests, the fights. Many other friendships may not have survived through all that pressure, but somehow this one has. What is the unique bond that keeps these three very different people together? I think there is within me the desire to be really loyal to somebody and also to love. Well, I know that there is. It's not thinking. I am a person who wants to be loyal with someone. And I genuinely do believe very much in love. And through all the times when they thought I was crazy or I thought I w they were crazy, right? There was still that desire. Like, I really think that this is what brings us together more than anything. Is even when we get far apart, we want to come back together, so we do what it takes. I think we love each other. That's... It's that simple? Yeah. When push came to shove, we'd be walking together on the right, on the right side of an issue. And that's what's kept us together, because that sort of common vision, that sort of that North Star of, of a society that, that puts nobody in an institution because they're a person with a disability, because they're old, that's what drives us. No children, you know, who, sh who shouldn't have the best wheelchairs and the best hearing aids and interpreters and so that common vision. The only time Judith gets behind the piano these days is when she's singing with her friends. Through the shared struggles, the friendship has come full circle, and the student Jack and Marcia met 16 years ago has now become the teacher. differences lies the core of the humanity and she's taught me that with spirit you really don't have to end up dead you know spiritually dead even in a culture that particularly would have Judith dead I mean she's a survivor and that spirit is what I'm so attracted to I've had a lot of wonderful teachers uh, a couple of more actually to do with school, but much more just people I, I spend a lot of time with. <clears throat> Judith is one of those teachers. The, the friendship has lasted as far as I'm concerned because of respect. I mean, I, I love Judith because I respect her. And I, and I love Jack because the man is working to make this a better planet. You know, that's what it's about. Like, the, there's three human beings here that are working to make this a little bit of a better planet. I mean, humbly, but unless you believe in hope and change, I think all of us should get out of the business of at least working with other people, okay? And Judith is a symbol of what's possible. And I think our friendship is a symbol of people for what's possible. Now, some people are scared to death of it, and they're threatened by it, and, and rather than celebrating it, they, they get jealous of it or they think, you know, it's too much or it's too intense. You know what I've learned? And an 86-year-old friend of mine said to, this, to me last week, she said, stay away from those people. Like, stay away from the people who are negative and who have no hope and who are cynical. Because some of us would really like to change the world and we're going to. But we're not going to do it alone. We're going to do it together. We're going to do it with our friends. As we've seen, it takes a lot of work to maintain a friendship over time. 
People have different expectations of friendship, but sometimes a common vision forces them to do the hard work. Next week on It's About Time, journalist Sada Yazaman explores our longing for home. Some see home as a physical place, others as a state of mind. We'll meet two women with different visions of home. I'm Rita Deverell.